I am joined by the one and only Dr. Paul Jared Frank. What are we talking about? Health, wealth, economics? Aren't they all yes, the no. same? Aren't we they are all the talking, same? They are all the same. Um, <laughs> especially when you think about one's personal health, their well-being. And I, I'm, you know, I'm your friend and I'm your fan. And first, I want to congratulate you on your new Thank book. Thank you. And I, I wanted to have this chat with you tonight. Um, by the way, it was I worth the wait. It was worth the wait because you look beautiful. You got the pink and the lighting. I mean, you did it right. I don't. I, I don't have hair I and makeup. Could, I don't know how I could look good. I haven't seen you in in many months. And and what's <laughs> interesting about COVID? It's funny in the beginning, especially a lot of women in New York were saying, "I'm going to be home. Uh, I need to see my doctor. I need to see my dermatologist." And the best one I know comes out with a book. And what I love the most about it is the title is the pro-aging playbook. And I want you to start on that. Yeah. Because well, so often people, no one ever says pro-aging. And so yeah. I, I want you to start by telling us, what does that mean? Well, I think it's actually such a perfect discussion, particularly with you as an expert in all things business, because pro-aging to me is really kind of like a backlash at the the marketing ploy of the last several generations of anti-aging. They want to be the best selves. So I really, I want first and foremost, this book to be about the perspective of aging, not what you can do to reverse it. And so much of this has to do with the marketing world and consumerism we live in. So it's really about like bringing a lot of things together and not just what I could do to your face, but what I could kind of decipher and filter in your lifestyle to kind of get you to that best state. And everyone has their own different version of their best selves. And I kind of want to I want to be the anti-cosmetic dermatologist in helping people get to that point. Okay, but right there. So when you meet with women or when we see women or men who do look their best, who yeah. are 40 or 50 or 60 or 70, it's not that they look like they're 35. No. It's that they look like no. an awesome 45. Yeah. You know, it's not about objective beauty. It's about vitality. It's a vitality. What does that mean? It's a mo it's mojo, you know what I mean? And so much of it comes from it. Don't get me wrong, what I do, injections, lasers, skincare, they're a piece of a puzzle. But what I need people to know that it is just an icing on the cake. How you exercise, how you love, how you relate to other people, how you eat, how you meditate, and how you do so many other things in your life contribute to the overall image in the mirror. And uh, a lot of it has to do with self-perception. And fortunately, we are living in a world where we, I hope we are developing out of objective stereotypes of beauty. And a lot of the things that I do, um, they're, not, they're not just for ladies that lunch anymore. They're a form of grooming for a new generation and they're much more acceptable uh, and, and accessible to a broader audience. Unfortunately, because of the consumerism of beauty, there's a lot of information that I have to help people decipher and sift through. And that's really what the book is about. But have you always felt this way? Or did you yourself, as someone who sees all of these extraordinary patients of yours over the years say, yeah. if only I did this, 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 if only you did yeah. these 15 things on me, then I'd be happy, then I'd be young, then I'd be beautiful. No. Is that how you sort of, you yourself got to this conclusion? You know, part of it is a personal journey. I'm 50. I've been practicing dermatology for 23 years. We all have our old, you know, we all feel young. We, we all think we're old at 25 or 30. You know, again, another thing coming to you. Or so does my, my 78 year old father says, wait till you're in your 70s. But um, also just the journey of seeing patients. I mean, you know, I've spent a lot of time treating all types of people from all genders, socioeconomic classes all different types of people. And it's funny, it's ironic. Sometimes the most empirically beautiful people are the most insecure and feel the ugliest. And I have 90 year old patients that other people would be like, why are you messing around doing these things? But they feel beautiful, it makes them feel good. And it, what's great about that is it shows that um, there's no objectivity. Life in general, particularly beauty is a subjective phenomena. So I wanna do whatever I can to help people get what's right in between their ears while they're getting the needles in their face. But you're the last person who I would think, or who someone who doesn't know you would think would be talking about this because you're someone who by profession- That's what I do. 
these treatments, these products are your key to beauty and happiness. Yeah. But you're trying to explain to us this missing link. So yeah, for people who aren't your patients, but for people who have the opportunity to read your book and learn from you, what are things they can start thinking about and addressing right now, especially while so many of us are home with less access? Yeah, well, you know, and again, I, I think it's a perfect time to think of the perspectives of this book because it's not just about beauty, it's in every form of life. Um, I think you get the biggest changes in health, wellness, and beauty, not by doing things that are drastic. You know, diets don't work. You know, you have to do small lifestyle changes in many different facets of your life that will give big results. Give me small a favorite one. I mean, listen, what you do in exercise is the, the biggest anti-aging thing you can do. And it's not about being a marathon runner. It's about staying active, moving your body, and doing things that are going to affect your mood, your physicality, and the way you look in the mirror. And exercise is just one the, the, the function of movement is just one example from nutrition, meditation, um, at-home skincare, procedures you could do in a dermatologist. These are all pieces of the puzzle. And although what I do I'm very proud of, I view myself as the icing on the cake. And, you know, it's an important but part. You, you just said something that I would love for you to elaborate on because you talked about fitness or exercise as movement. Right. Yeah. And oftentimes people feel defeated, either like they're doing the ultimate workout or they're their best self or they're doing absolutely nothing. There yeah. are these two extremes. Yeah. So the way you're thinking, are you saying it's just about even if it's the seven minute app or just being active, doing it's about something. taking the stairs, not the elevator. It's about taking the walk, not the Uber. It's about taking every opportunity to do something that's in your overall best interest, because working out like an animal for six months is and it's not sustainable neither are certain diets they're not sustainable neither are thinking that you can go to the dermatologist and get a whole bunch of shots and spend a whole bunch of money and you're going to feel beautiful about yourself forever it's not like that it's about finding simple sustainable routines in your life including skincare um that is going to make you feel good about yourself because again the consumerism of what people are sold every day in the beauty and wellness market um, are often just unsustainable things. They just are. So what I hear you talking about, or, or the word that is coming to my mind in not working out like an animal and just being active are things that make you feel joyful. Because yeah. a diet isn't joyful. A diet, right, right now, for many of us, one silver lining of being home is we're actually eating three meals a day with our kids. And yeah. for me, for the first time in my life, well, and I'm not complaining at all about my weight, but I'm 10 pounds heavier than I am in any other summer. Yeah. But in any other summer, I would be concerned about it. I would be upset about it. But actually, of course. the joy of actually sitting down and eating, eating all my meals with my kids every night has yeah. changed my perspective. Have yeah. you gained some different perspective in the last few months since lots of what we can do has been altered and you're well, not your ultimate best self? What I gained was five pounds. You know, I was sick with COVID. I lost 10 pounds and then I gained 15. And the same way, my whole life, I was that person who was always like, oh, I could benefit from losing five pounds. Everyone's like that. And I'm in great shape. I know that, but it's just a mindset. And now I'm so much more comfortable. And I think in so many aspects in the new world, I'm taking my advice. But, you know, I'm good at dishing the advice. I could write all about it. But a lot of it comes out of my personal struggle and journey, which I speak about. And I'm finding greater ease with listening to my own advice, having less of a sense of urgency, accepting yourself in certain ways, and doing my best to just make small changes along the way, because you can't do everything. You just can't. And, uh, you know, th there, are, there were a lot of advantages to, you know, from being at home. One of them getting to be with live with you at 9 a.m., that I do miss. Yeah. Now I have to work and I have to record you. But, um, you know, again, a lot of what we're going through now with this post-COVID thing is a forced change of perspective. And that's a lot of what I'm trying to do for people in this book. And it, of course, it has to do with the way we view ourselves in the mirror and in our hearts. So early on in this journey for you, would, when you think back to yourself 10 years ago, when you were building your practice, building your reputation, did you ever think that you would be thinking about um, 
the, the comfort of being at ease, right? At ease is no. not something that I think of no. when I think of someone with your profile or your history. No. No, it's not. You know, youth is wasted on the young. We all think we, you know, the, the best form of uh, knowledge is knowing how little you know. And as I turned 50 this last year, I realized I got to stay very open minded about things. You know, while I was growing my practice, I was focusing on my art and my skill and technology and all these things. I'm at a stage in my career now. And it started seven years ago when I started doing transcendental meditation with my wife. It just opened up my mind, realizing that there are other facets to make me the best of, at what I do. And that really had to do also with the openness of, of the world. I mean, you know, beauty and wellness used to be on opposite sides of the cafeteria making fun of each other. You know, they did not get along. You know, people who went for shots and chemical peels were narcissists. People who were into wellness were like foodie, Indeed. restrictive, judgy people. You know what I'm saying? And I think now, and I have to give this credit to the millennials, they really view a lot of beauty and wellness as just a form of grooming. And I think that's where the technology and where the industry is going. And it opens, opens up the industry to a larger socioeconomic uh, group of people and just people of all shapes and sizes. Can you go back to TM, Transcendental Meditation, for just a second? Because again, um... TM has been something traditionally that was sort of in a space for, you know, people that were already predisposed that that was their lane, right? Right. You know, Alexander Technique people, uh, you know, true yogis. Yeah. Yeah. And then it sort of became Hollywoodish, but yeah. sort of what it means to you and the space that it occupies. Because for me, the one thing TM, just that 10 minutes does, it gives me like a little bit of cushion yeah. to not just shoot from the hip where I'm knocking somebody between the eyes. It just gives <laughs> me that little thing. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. Well, you know what? I found TM, you know, again, when I first started with TM, I actually did it as a birthday gift to my wife. I said, I'm gifting you the course, but the real gift is that I'm going to do it with you. And I was someone that was kind of opposed to it. I was one of these, oh, that's woo woo. I'm a doctor. I'm this. I'm like, I don't have time for that. I don't need that. So my gift to her was the open-mindedness to do it. And like, like someone who says they can't get hypnotized, I was like, I was in. I was 100% in. Um, what, I re what really appealed to me about TM as opposed to other forms of spirituality meditation is that it had a very scientific basis. In fact, TM is the most studied um, form of meditation uh, of, of, any, uh, of any form out there. It, it's been used in drug rehabilitation, in uh, prison rehabilitation, um, and so many various forms of you know, high blood pressure, anxiety, all these different things. So that was kind of like the hook for me. And then I just really fell into the, the slightly spiritual nature of it, even though it's not tied to a religion. For somebody who could be watching right now, they could look at the two of us and say, gag me. You are, you're both super privileged. You, you know, for yeah. me, I have the opportunity uh, to see you as a patient because I live in New York, yeah. because I can afford to see you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned it a moment ago, the changes that have happened, A, in your industry, but B, in the mindset that you're talking about, have broadened out this wellness to people across a socioeconomic spectrum. So yeah. for people right now who do want to make changes, that are gonna improve their aesthetics and really their self-confidence, what are the basic things that we can do right now? Yeah, well, first of all, I think if they're looking at us, they're going, damn, they look good. I think that's the first thing. No, but you know, in all honesty, a lot of what I'm trying to sell people is not to be sold too much. And that self-confidence, vitality, and your own form of beauty is an accessible thing. And that includes things that you could do at home with skincare things that you can do at home without hiring a fancy trainer or having like a, like taking, like taking the stairs instead of the elevator, like spending 20 minutes with yourself every day that actually will give you more time to do other things. Like, like screening out people in your life that are constricting your efforts rather than expanding um, the goodness. You don't have to go for an expensive option for everything. Um, and that learning that eating dietary habits that are simple 
may be better off than, you know, a, a paid for at home delivery diet plan, you know, um, and it's, it's not that I don't think that there are things out there that are money well spent, but I think we live in a world of so much content. We're given so many things. And all I want to do is help people filter that comment at, at any socioeconomic level. So when you see a patient and, and they walk into you and they're saying, right, I think back to, right, the 90s when millions of women in America walked into their hair salons with a picture of Jennifer Aniston. Oh, my God. Said, I want to look yeah, like yeah, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay? And that resulted in thousands of tears yeah. between hairdressers and their clients. <laughs> How do you, as a doctor who's there doing procedures, can you tap in when you see a person who thinks this procedure is going to make me beautiful, this procedure is going to make me yeah. happy? Do you feel that? I do. You know, fortunately in New York, it's a different aesthetic. In L, I always say people on the West Coast, they bring a picture of saying who they want to look like. On the East Coast, they bring you a picture of who they don't want to look like. And I think that's very important. It makes my job a little bit easier. We don't, I, I, so I, I treat faces, I don't treat features. You know what I'm saying? No, uh, I don't know what that means. Can you explain well, that? Well, I, I don't like, I'm not looking to give people cheekbones or give people lips. I'm, you know, I, I don't want them wearing their features like letters on a handbag. I try and look at the, the whole picture. I talk about their habits. I, I look at their body relative to their face, their cheeks versus their lips. And I try and get people into my mindset. And listen, it takes an enormous amount of psychology. I actually went to Vassar College as a psych major, and I thought I was going to become a psychiatrist. And then I figured out Botox works better than Prozac. So, uh, you know, Maybe I both. Maybe both. You know, I do believe the consultation is very important because I want to make sure that, first of all, I vibe with my patients because there are red flags. We know that there are abuses in my industry. Um, and I want people, uh, you know, I'm not the best in the world, but I want, I want people to find the right, I want to be the right doctor for the right patient. And part of that is having uh, a lifestyle conversation and an expectation conversation. And I think that's what you're getting at. I feel like what I'm hearing is sort of a bifurcated approach in terms of new technology, but with a very, very old fashioned way of thinking about health and wellness. Yes, and it takes conversation, it takes talking and it takes time. And fortunately, I've built the practice enough where I can take that time with people. And as you know, you know, I have um, I have a lot of fans that I can, you know, I consider them extended family and I know their lives and they know mine. And um, that's what really helps me to do the best work for them, getting to know them. And what I do for one patient is not consistent. There is no best treatment. There is no best nutritional supplement. There is no best exercise. The trick and my greatest success is when I find the right things for that person. And to me, that's that's what turns me on in my job. Did getting sick completely knock you off your feet mentally yeah. and physically? In like terms like a of pan. Before you were sick, when I think about you, you're very much a, I got this. Right. Yeah. Has COVID and that experience, which was completely out of your control and yeah. something even as a doctor, um, you could say nobody is an absolute expert on. No. Nope. Has that changed your approach to life the last few months? It has. I mean, it was a frying pan in the face while I was sprinting. You know, I have so many other things. My book came out. I have a new office, big building project downtown in the West Village. My private label skincare all these fabulous things. And I'm really running at full speed, not taking my own advice, doing everything with a sense of urgency. And then boom, 103 fever for 13 days, not being able to breathe and being at home on oxygen. Um, it really made me follow my own kind of lessons, which is um, slow down, breathe, and, um, you know, take things one step at a time. And, you know, it, it, again, I'm good at preaching things, but I'm constantly trying to do things with more meticulousness and less urgency. And I think this is true whenever you have ups and downs in economies or personal life. When people go through tough times, 
they're, they're forced to stop and reassess. And uh, it was certainly one for me. Did getting sick um, sort of reconnect you to, um, I, don't, I don't mean ground you, but knock you back to a, to a, to, to a, a place of, of kind of human reality. I actually remember, I ran into you yeah. the Monday night that our kid, that New York was getting shut down and kids were finishing school. I ran That's into right. you on the yeah. street. I remember you were leaving dinner with your sister and I asked you momentarily about COVID and you answered me, but you were sort of, you, you sort of, you, you, you were talking about COVID like it was over here, yeah. right? Like, yes, here's this thing and it's over here, but we're over here. And then it hit you. Yeah. How much did that sort of put the brakes and say like, um, you know what, Paul? You're a human just like the rest of us. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and maybe, and of course, I, it's terrible that you got sick, but maybe in, in some way, do you see it as some sort of benefit for your life? You know, listen, there are lessons to be learned with everything. And I think a lot of that has to do with your perspective. It's not, success is defined by your adaptation, in my opinion. It's easy when every, when it's the roaring 20s and the, the new millennium and everything like that. It's really people, how, how people get back on the horse. And it's something I've always counseled people on and I have to take my own advice on. But I will tell you, I've learned... I'm very demanding of myself. I'm my biggest judgment. I'm not in competition with anybody else, but I'm desperately in competition with myself. And one of the things I've honestly learned is to just give myself the opportunity to have lower expectations of myself sometimes. And that's been really difficult for me. It's something I think about every day because I'm always want to run, 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 run. And I've learned that um, I am human. And um, it doesn't mean I still can't make great achievements, but that I just have to like give myself a little break. And I still struggle with that physically because I am about 95%. And I wish I could do those soul cycle classes like I used to, but you know, I'm working on it. I'm a work in progress. We all are. When you talked about sort of the mass consumerism and you know, sort of where it lives in health and wellness and anti-aging, it's crippling, right? Especially yeah. if you think about women, right? I'm 44. Yeah. And if you sit down with women, especially women who have disposable income across a table, you, you'll hear over the course of 10 minutes, thousands of dollars in, I'm drinking collagen tea and I'm taking I know, 40 I know. vitamins. If there's one thing that you think in your life every day, besides TM, that you would want people who you want to age well to consider, what is it? It's what my dad always says, and this is true with every aspect of life, the rule of kiss, keep it simple, stupid. Whenever you are, whether it's business, your personal endeavors, your beauty, whenever you find yourself overwhelmed, think about how you can make things simpler, and that is always the best road traveled. And, and again, it has to do with a lot of the consumerism is going on. Um, and you know, if you have to ask me what one practice is, I think truthfully things like the meditation have been the most influential because that's what opens you up to making the rest of your life simple. It's like the first step is giving yourself a moment to breathe and think. And we just don't give ourselves that opportunity. But then how do we address, right? Especially as it relates to beauty and skincare all the products and the treatments that we're offered right now yeah. and that people are panicked about aging. Hey, listen, there's great skincare out there. Botox does work, lasers do work. Um, you know, I'm certainly guiding people on the many things that they could put on their skin and to their skin. Um, but I, I always tell people, like I'm saying to myself right now, post COVID, one thing at a time. You don't need 20 chefs in the kitchen. You don't need 20 creams. You don't need to do 20 procedures all within two month period. We're all in this for the long haul. And it's a blessing if we live long enough and live healthy enough to care about the way we look. Because once you start having other health issues in your life, you realize that vanity is a blessing. Because when you don't feel well or you're sick, you don't care about the way you look. And yes, even I didn't care about the way I looked when I had COVID. I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. And I have patients in their 80s that say to me, should I really be giving this all up? I mean, is it really worth all this? And I say, you tell me. If you feel well enough, 
to get up every day, feel good about yourself, and want to look your best, man, I think that's a very good start to anyone's day. But how should we think about the word best, okay? Yeah. Because I think that's sort of this killer word. Oh, yeah. That, that, that what is the definition of best? Well, right? this is a, right? it's is a it personal wash your, Is it literally, is it wash your face, brush your teeth? Like, what is best? Because that yeah. pursuit of best is, is crippling. Yeah. Well, you know what? You can't put a dollar value on this. You can't put a procedure on best. Um, and, you know, you, you can't put a stereotype on it. Uh, unfortunately, this is the personal journey because you can't spend your life comparing yourself to other people. You have to, you know, everyone knows their own version of a good hair day and everyone has something that bothers them about themselves. It's okay to be bothered by things. It's okay to pursue it. But again, what's right for you is not right for other people. Um, protect, you know, the, if you're going to do anything in this world, you have to minimize the things that are doing you injustice. And that's laying in too much sun, drinking too much alcohol, abuse of prescription drugs, ab abuse of illegal drugs. I mean, I don't live, I don't tell people they have to live a saintly restrictive lifestyle. I certainly don't, but they have to find a balance because the best way to grow old gracefully is to not abuse yourself, right? Um, and I think it's also the cheapest way to start, you know? So uh, after that, well, then it's a personal journey and then you gotta come see me or read the book. <laughs> you said we all have things about ourselves that we never like. Is there something that you've never liked about yourself? Oh my that, God, where, where do I start? That, that, well, maybe over time it changes. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I was heavy set as a teenager. Um, weight and physicality was always my issue. I was not athletic. I'm much more athletic as an adult than I was as a young man. And I was always concerned. I mean, I get on a scale every day of my life. I won't go to a hotel unless there's a scale. And it's not that I'm like body dysmorphic. I'm very proud of the body. Oh, maybe, but I'm very I mean, proud of who I, I am. To, and... Let me tell you, I'm no doctor, but I won't go to a hotel without a scale. I think that's not normal. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I don't diet. I live a healthy lifestyle. I eat whatever I want on the weekends. I love to cook during the week. I'm a one meal a day person. I, I find balance. I, I'm very cautious about finding balance in my life. And that's one thing that I've always done, which is why I said it's amazing to me, like you, I've like, I've been enjoying my extra five pounds. Um, and to me, like I said, that, that I, I, since I've been a teenager and once I got control of my weight and my fitness and my physicality, because of simple habits like getting on a scale or knowing what I can and cannot eat, I've always stayed in great shape. I actually do like getting on a scale. For me, it's literally when my underwear is tight is when I'm like, girl. <laughs> Can really? you tell us, um, what is your day look? In terms of wellness and yeah. um, health and confidence, because you just mentioned on a weekday you have one meal, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah. What does your day look like? Like, tell me your day. Well, I I'm pretty regimented during the week. It's on the weekends where I spoil myself. Where I usually don't free. drink. Yeah, I don't drink during the week. You know, I'm usually in bed by 10 o'clock. I'm up at 6 a.m. Uh, I'll do my morning meditation. I'll do my 45 minutes of exercise. I'm not an extreme exercise person. I get in, you know, 40, 45 minutes stretching, a soul cycle class, a Peloton, some yoga, weightlifting. I like to mix it up. And then I'm, I kind of hit the pavement. I'm on stage every day. I see 20 to 35 people a day on a normal day in my office. I'll graze a little bit. I'll have an avocado. I'll have some nuts. I'm not a sit down meal lunch type of person. If I'm lucky and I have the time, I'll get a second meditation in in the afternoon. And then usually at night is when I enjoy that one meal because I love food and I want the time to enjoy it. But you know, um, I like that I'm on a bit of a marathon every day uh, throughout the day and that I'm tired at the end of the end, end of the day. Um, so, you know, again, some people would think it's too busy of a lifestyle, but I function best when I'm multitasking and I'm busy because I'm, I'm a native New Yorker. What is your, so especially for people who are reading this book who might not be your clients or patients, what is your skincare regimen? Because huh. something I, made you decide you wanted, in a world of all this consumerism, you decided yeah. to add to it with a skincare line. Yeah, I'll tell you, again, I, I'm a guy, guys typically, not to overly stereotype, 
don't like lo big skincare regimens. Neither do I. I mean, I have to I shave every day. Yeah, I mean, I have to shave every day. I have to shower every day. I got to brush my teeth every day. I mean, I wash my face with my own organic cleanser. I use Dr. Hauschka's moisturizing mask because my skin is very dry after shaving. Um, and uh, once in a while, uh, if I, my skin's off, I'll use a, a vitamin C and E serum at night. That's it. That's really it. I use Dove sh soap in the shower. Um, but I do like my once a year Fraxel, my once a year skin tightening all therapy. And I've been known to indulge in my own injectable expertise every once in a while. So, and I exercise every day and watch what I eat. Time out. You can inject yourself. Yeah. I don't trust anybody else. It's like, a, I don't, I, it's like, you know, if you're a professional driver, you don't want to be a passenger, but I do Isn't very that really small. hard to do? It, it is if I were doing a lot, but again, as with most of my patients, I always recommend small changes frequently. You don't want to be on a roller coaster too much, too little, too much, too little. So like my, like my devout patients, um, I do very small amounts every few months. And I, basically, I don't want to make any changes that anyone else could ever notice. And that's exactly what I would want for my patients. I just want people to think I and they look great. And that's it. But yeah, I've learned how in a mirror, you know, guys know how to shave so I can figure out what to do with the needle. Man, I'm really telling you a lot here, by the way. I appreciate it. Listen, I, listen, I know and I know I've taken 30 minutes, but I, I do want to close with just talking about this because I think that the title of your book is a lot more than a title. My impression from what I've read so far, this is a mantra. Yes. Are you, is your goal to really transform the way we think about aging. And I wanna ask you, in terms of your happiness and wellness, Dr. Paul Jared Frank, when he was 20, 30, 40, 50, how did he feel, how did you feel as a person in terms of confidence, beauty inside and out, all those different decades? Because we all love to say, oh my gosh, I wish I could be 20 again. Do you really wish that? No, absolutely not. And I think for a lot of my patients too, myself, with every decade, I have to make tweaks. I have to make adjustments. Aging is not easy. And I'm, I'm up for the challenge because I see results from every change I make in my life that feeds my confidence and vitality. And although I still am a work in progress, um, I recognize the value of the work that I put in more and more with every decade. I feel good about myself. And you know what? You know, I'm glad to be alive, especially after COVID. I'm glad to be alive and hey, I wanna look good along the way. But what I'm hearing from you, while you're saying to me aging isn't easy, it sort of seems like your journey is telling me that aging with the right mindset and practices is actually excellent. Well, it's attainable, it's attainable. But um, you know, I don't want people to think that like, you know, it, it, it's like, it's something that like you follow a formula and it should be easy. I think the greatest successes come from hard work. And um, when you see that success, you know, it's like um, vanity is not narcissism. Vanity is reward for the work that you put into yourself. And you deserve to look in the mirror and feel proud, regardless of what other people think of you. No matter what you do to yourself, you need to feel good about yourself. And um, to me, it's not just a pro, it's the, this is the pro-aging playbook, but to me, it's a pro-aging lifestyle. And it's just, a, it's, it's just a mindset. And I think, you know, hopefully I'll be on this planet a long time. And I, I like this mindset. Does 50 or 51 yeah. um, look and feel better than you thought it would when you were 41? Absolutely. If you were 41 and you thought about 50, I have a feeling yeah. 50 looks way better than you thought it would. I, it does. It really does. And uh, I, I look forward to the rest. I mean, you know, every generation, they're like 40 is the new 50, the new 30, the new this, the new that. I mean, people are getting more and more aware about how to take care of themselves. And I don't think it's just wealthy white people. I think that um, there's a greater acceptance of taking care of yourself out there. I think there's a potential for us all to live better, not just live longer. And I want to help spread the word that it's not just about beauty. It's about the way you make you feel. And it's not an exclusive club. It doesn't have to be an exclusive club. Go to bed early. Wash, brush your teeth. <laughs> wash your face. Um, yeah. 
I don't want to feel like I'm restrictive. I, I don't want people to feel like I'm some saint. You can have fun. It's not just work. So I can tell you without pause, there's pretty much no one who's confusing you for a saint. I'm just letting Good. you know. Yes. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for sharing this book. I want to thank you for sharing this time with me. Um, we are going to sign off. If there's one message that you want, you want people to take away, because I know people want to read this book, but if yeah. there's one message tonight, when we finish and they message their sister or their friend or their brother or yeah. their husband, what do you want them to have? I want them, I want everyone to, I, to find a way to enjoy the ride. And what I really want to do is be a piece of that puzzle for you. That's what I want because it's a short life and we, we, we deserve to look and feel our very best. It's not something to feel bad about. Too many people feel bad about it. Okay, we're leaving, but you have to tell me, behind you are all those records. Can you please tell us about that wall? Because that's that now a window into who you are. That's true. Um, I'm a kid of the 80s. I grew up, my dentist dad and my mom nurse decided for a short period to open up roller discos in the early 80s. Um, I, li I lit, I know, this is for another- need. For another roller idea discos. Book. I know you're gonna have to read about it in the book, but um, I, I I grew up in my preteen years instead of going to bar mitzvahs and birthday parties, living in a DJ booth of roller discos in Brooklyn. So I ended up becoming a DJ, a music fanatic, and a collector of all things music. And if I wasn't a cosmetic dermatologist, I would have been a music producer. And the rest of it, you're gonna have to read about. <laughs> <laughs> the saddest thing about us all working from home is that this book party was not held at a roller. I know. Um, I know. You know what? It's going to have to happen in the future. Hey, well. Dr. Frank. Love thank you. Thank you. you so much. Thank you for this evening. Great to see you. I'll be you. watching. I'll see all you later. Time. Bye, everybody. Bye.